320. Let's stand right before we give. Shall we gather at the river a good old American hymn? blessings, your caring for us, your um, guiding and directing us and leading us along the way. I pray, dear Father, you bless us as we go into the, the time of worship where we give back to you what you've given, a part of what you've given to us. I pray, dear Father, you bless the gift of the giver. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. that part you gotta help me with the rest oh that's good that's good I think you got it well done this baby can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he Thank you, Melody. If you'd like to hear a message tonight in Spanish, follow Brother Aguilar back to the uh, fellowship room. And I just want to say that uh, if it would be of, of help to somebody, that if you are working on Spanish or you have a child or teenager taking Spanish, and if it would be help to be immersed in Spanish, uh, as long as the parents give approval, then you're always welcome to join them and, uh, and that'll help sharpen up your Spanish. Amen. So 
Jeremiah 23 in your Bible, please. Jeremiah chapter 23. While you're turning there, Micah, the prophet, we don't speak a great deal about him because it's one of those minor prophets in the back of your Old Testament that all too often get overlooked. But Micah, I think, summarized how things are in this age insofar as ministry is concerned, preaching is concerned, spiritual leadership is concerned. He said, if a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie. Now it says walking in the spirit. Interestingly, small s spirit. So there is a spirit there. There's a spirit involved. His own spirit is engaged. And people are often attracted to a man who has a spiritual disposition. And if a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie... So just because he's spiritual doesn't necessarily mean what he's saying is the truth. He do lie saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink. He says, he says hey, I'm here to tell you it's okay to go out and get plastered. It's okay to have your social drink. It's okay to have your cocktails. Okay to have your, your beer in the, in the refrigerator. You know, it's, it's okay to hang out with the guys after work. It's just okay. I don't see anything wrong with it. And I'm here to tell you, I, I've, I've searched that Bible. I can't find a thing against it. In fact, I think it'd be a great way to evangelize. And if he prophesies along those lines, Micah said, he shall even be the prophet of this people. They will so gravitate to that message that they'll say, yeah, that's our preacher. That's the man we want to listen to. That's who we want to follow. I'm, I'm glad that Micah said, he shall be. He said, it won't be me. I will never preach a message like that. My, in fact, it, quite the contrary. I'm going to tell you, stay away from the wine. Stay away from the strong drink. But I'm just here to tell you, if a man were to stand and, and from the depths of his spirit, say, I just feel like it, it's okay for us to enjoy that aspect of life and to have our wine with our dinner and you know to have our beer at the boys and and to just kind of loosen up a little bit let's have our tailgate parties let's use it to witness for jesus if a guy were to stand and say that there he would have a following because people want to hear that message and that's all too often where we're heading today our men and increasingly women who will preach something contrary to the Bible, what the Bible plainly teaches, but they make it sound so alluring, and they are so sincere. They're in the spirit. It's a very spiritual message, and it resonates with people today. It connects with them because it's what they want. It, it tickles the ears, and such people will today have their following, and they will experience a measure of success, if that's how we're going to measure success. And in the process, they will lead lots of people astray. And in the long run, get their lives very messed up. Let's pray and ask God to bless us this evening. Lord Jesus, would you now meet with us now as we've opened your word. We're looking to you, Holy Spirit, to please guide us. And Lord, we want to keep this pulpit on fire for you. We want to keep it right with you. We want whatever's proclaimed here to be truth. Truth as is defined in the word you've given to us that we know that we know as the Bible. God, we do pray that always until the trumpet sounds and we're caught up in the air to be with our Lord Jesus, right up to the very last moment, may this church stand for righteousness and holiness. Maybe a church that promotes honor and self-discipline, self-sacrifice, that we yet have high standards of personal conduct when it's all said and done. And Lord, be it a popular or unpopular message, if we grow to great numbers or remain relatively modest, I pray nonetheless we will stand by the truth. May that be the preaching that goes forth, goes forth from this pulpit. May that be the conversation of our lives to those around us. We thank you for it, Lord Jesus, you, as you meet with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. What we're going to see here in these, in Jeremiah 23, is 
the leading cause of the downfall and destruction of the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. What it boils down to is poor spiritual leadership. I realize right now in our country, we're looking at seemingly every institution in trouble. I was just reading today from a magazine that spoke of what's happening on the university campuses of America, and what's happening there. Uh, what we're dealing with now in the White House goes back to the universities of 30, 40 years ago. Okay, it's, it's, it's the, the training that's gone into these minds that they are now acting out. It's, what, it's how they were trained. They were trained to look askance at America. They were trained to belittle the founding fathers. They were trained that free enterprise is evil and freedom itself is suspect unless it's a freedom exercised to further the, uh, the ideology of the left. But if it's conservative values being promoted, then, then you are justified in doing everything in your power to mute those voices and minimize that influence. But we're also seeing it not just in education from now, truly from kindergarten through university, but we're seeing it in entertainment. We're seeing it in the news media. We're seeing it seemingly on every front. But let me tell you where it goes back to. It goes back to the pulpits of America. It goes back to, spore, to poor spiritual leadership. The same for Israel, the same for Judah. It came back to poor spiritual leadership. And now for the United States of America, what is bringing us to a point of downfall and destruction is poor spiritual leadership. We're suffering from that now. We're suffering the effects of generations of men who are not preaching sound doctrine, who are not willing to take a stand on the issues of the day. I, I remember when uh, Billy Sunday, not that I knew him personally, let me get that straight, but I remember reading of him that he said, if there's ever an attempt to remove the Bible from the classrooms of America, the streets will run red with blood because the American people will never countenance it. They'll never tolerate it. Now that may have been true in the 1930s, but by the 1960s, we were ripe and ready. We had just, we had experienced a cultural revolution that set up conditions to where they are now. But somewhere between, in that first half of the 19th century, the churches were becoming more liberal. We're, we're, we're no longer preaching, not taking a strong stand, not preaching righteousness and holiness. And as a result, now we saw a chain reaction and the result was that the Supreme Court could have the Bible removed, and there was not an uprising among the people. And that led immediately from 1963 onward, we saw some of the shocking results of that hitting the country almost immediately. And it's only gotten worse with time. Jehovah, here in Jeremiah 23, criticized the poor quality of Judah, speaking of the, the Jewish kingdom of Judah, Judah's spiritual leadership. Notice in verse 1 in Jeremiah 23, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Now you'll see a, a connection between pastor and pasture. The reason why those words are so similar is because they, they, they relate to a similar thing. As we go on in verse number 2, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people, he says to them, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds. And they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. And they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Now, in this passage, what is another name for a pastor? Shepherd, all right? Pastor, now, and that's the connection. Pasture, the place where sheep feed on the, the green grass. 
They're overseen by a pastor. Similar words because it's a similar thought. The man who leads them to the place where they can be fed and watered. He takes care of them. He looks out for them. So the pastors or the shepherds. Now, who do the shepherds represent? He is the good shepherd. The Lord Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. But these shepherds, plural, who are they? Yes. And who are the pastors supposed to be? Spiritual leaders, okay? Or if you prefer religious leaders. But that's what these, that's what these are supposed to be. These are supposed to be the, 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 the leaders of God's people who are supposed to keep feeding them properly. And what do you think they're supposed to be fed on? The Word of God. Okay, this, this, is, this is your soul's meat. And I'm using the word meat in a biblical sense of, of food. This is your soul's food. This is your soul's meat. This is what you need. Now, I don't know about you, but my tummy becomes very unhappy if I don't have a time of devotions with it about three times a day, all right? Uh, it, 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 really, it really likes it. It, it. it likes it when I come back one more time with cookies, all right, or something sweet, all right? It's just, just, that, just that little extra. And uh, so somehow in America we got this idea now that our souls can subsist on one feeding a week, now, beloved, stop and think, you know, 21 times a week for your belly and one time a week for your soul? Where is the priority? At what point do we, do we have to admit that it's talking about ourselves when it says, whose God is their belly? There, we have to keep the emphasis on it's the soul that needs to be fed. Now, I understand you can do a lot of feeding on your own. And you should. But God provides shepherds for a reason. Israel always had her priests and her prophets to help to feed these sheep. Those were the shepherds God gave. Those were the pastors God gave. Now, I think it's more than coincidental that we come in the New Testament era, and the men of God over a local church, they do have various titles. They're known as elder, the elder that is among you. Uh, they, are, they are the president of the corporation. They are the bishop, having spiritual headship over a particular segment of the body of Christ known as the local church. So they do have their, do have their role. But I find it interesting that of all those titles that could be utilized, I could refer to myself as Bishop Arthur Miracle, or, or a number of other ways we, we could put it, president or whatever I want to say, but the one that's biblical is the one, very one that shows up in Jeremiah 23, and that is pastor. I am to see to it that out of the, the vast flock that Jesus is assembling, the good shepherd is assembling, I've been given a little tiny segment of that, and I am to look out for and care for this body of sheep and make sure you're being well fed. Now, can I say it helps when the sheep show up? All right, I'll just be honest with you. It's... it's it's, it's hard to feed from a distance, all right? Uh, it, it's, 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 and and uh, from time to time, I do provide delivery service. It's called follow-up visits. But uh, it's so much better for you and so much easier on me if you just come to meet with the church family and enjoy the common meal and keep yourself strong and healthy. But this is what the shepherd is supposed to do. Now, we have here our pastors who are shepherds, our shepherds are spiritual leaders. So who are the sheep? Yeah, that's us, that's God's people. It's the Old Testament Jew, it's the New Testament Christian. Now I want you to drop a marker in Jeremiah 23 and turn all the way back to Revelation chapter two. While we're seeing the identified by Jeremiah and also by Ezekiel, is a disconnect between the pastors and the people. That's a very dangerous thing. It's a dangerous tendency in what we might call Christian religion. When our faith becomes just another religion, with its set of do's and don'ts, when it just becomes something we just go to because we're supposed to be there, and it's just part of our routine. And, and I believe in duty, and I believe in routine, and I believe in schedule. 
don't, don't, make, don't misunderstand me, but I also think that we don't just think, well, okay, I sit there, I endure it for an hour or two, I go home and I've done my thing for the week between me and God. And now, now that's done, I get on to my real life. Now this ought to be real life. And this ought to be something you are engaged in, you are interested in, you are invested in, and you're here to get everything you can get out of it. And every opportunity you have to sing the praises of Jesus Christ, you want to be part of that. Every time we pray to the, to the Lord God, you want to be part of that prayer. When we open up the Word of God to teach it or to preach it, and you want to get everything you can get out of it. You're not going to allow this, this is not just something you do, check it off your list and go on with your life. This is your life. This is what gives your life substance and meaning, and, and, and it, it, it's what, it's what kind of structures your life. It, 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 it's where the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And, and I realize in your personal life, in your private devotions, the Holy Spirit speaks to you, and, and, and you're, you're engaging with God. But somehow that seems to me to be the, the precursor, the prerequisite to what you're going to get when, when we come here and the Word of God is preached. It remains true that God's word is manifested through preaching. I, I read my Bible so that when I come under preaching, my heart and mind are already conditioned to receive what I'm given, and that's where the Holy Spirit can really clarify some things for me and speak to me and guide me and direct me and, and, and allow me to get a vision of what he wants from me. So just like in a, in, you go to take a college class, and they say, I'm sorry, you can't take, you know, uh, Algebra 2. So you've taken the prerequisite of Algebra 1. And you can't take Algebra 1 until you prove by, by a test that you're ready for Algebra 1. We're going to put you back in basic arithmetic to get you ready for Algebra 1, after which you can then take Algebra 2, after which we can look at trigonometry and, and other more advanced mathematical courses. Well, your personal devotions, that's the prerequisite for you to really get something out of a church service. If you're getting it, if it's all here, if this is the sum total of your Bible reading, and this is, this is all you're getting spiritually through the week, then I, I want to suggest you're, you're, you're often going to not be able to properly digest what you're receiving. You're, you're getting slabs of meat. I mean, when, when some of you that have been involved in fasting you understand that when you've gone for a day or two or three or four or more without eating, you don't, go, you don't sit down immediately to a big, heavy meal. You have to work your way back up to that point again. And when you come in here to church and, and we're trying to perhaps you know, serve something a little heavier or something a little more meaty, you're, you're just not ready to handle it. And you're not gonna, it's not going to sit well on your tummy. It's not going to digest well. But if you are continuously ingesting and you've you're, you're got some time with the Lord and you've got some time in his word, then you come in here and we chop off a hunk of steak and lay it before you, man, you can eat it with relish or ketchup. No, no, you can eat it with, and enjoy it and, and, just, 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 and, and be able to digest it and be able to, and it'll work for you much more efficiently than if you have nothing leading up to when you come to church. Now here, in Revelation chapter 2, and when I, when I, I said all that just to say that this should not merely be a religion, but when Christianity just simply becomes a religion, there is a dangerous tendency that develops. In Revelation chapter 2, the Lord Jesus is speaking to the seven churches of Asia Minor, from which we extrapolate much truth for the local church today. And by the way, those seven churches become a great overlay, an outline of seven periods of church history from the very beginning when Christ ascended back to heaven and the first churches were, 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 were off and running all the way up to the end of the, the, the Laodicean church age and the coming of Christ to receive us to himself again. The whole thing lays out beautifully. Now we're not going to attempt to get the church, the church history aspect of this what we are going to do is just see what Jesus said about two of the seven churches and how it applies to, 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 to real-life situations involving Christians today. Now, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, the Lord Jesus says, And under the, church of the, under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, 
who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou, thou canst not bear them that are, which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come quickly, come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick. Now a candlestick is a source of what? Light. Your light source will be removed. Some will look at that and say, you, you'll, you'll, lose your, you'll, lose, you'll lose your Bible-believing preacher and end up with one who's not going to teach the, the Word of God properly. And the light diminishes and fails. Or some would say you're losing your authority or your ability to, to properly represent the Lord. And you drift into darkness. Maybe it's just the total dissolution of that local church. But whatever it is, it sounds like it's something we want to avoid. Verse 5, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. You've got to turn around and go back and do the right things. Verse 6, Jesus says, but this thou hast. Here's, some, here's a good thing you're doing. That thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Well, it sounds to me like Nicolaitans are bad dudes. These are the, ba these are the black hat guys. These are the bad guys. Now, what is it that can make someone so awful that Jesus Christ says, I hate those people, and I'm glad you do too? It's like, whoa, that's pretty heavy. Go Advance to verse 12. And unto the angel, and to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with, with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest thine fast my name. And hast not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr and was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. And I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. And it goes on to speak about that, where you have a, a people that want to claim to be Christians, but they're messing with the world's stuff, committing a, a, a sacrificing to idols, committing fornication, verse 15. So hast also, so that... <laughs> So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Man, here are those Nicolaitans. The Lord hates Nicolaitans, and he hates their doctrine. Who are these people? It's surmised that this may go back to one of the six original Deacons, whose name was Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, and that this man, having been once uh, a pagan, who converted over to becoming a Jew, and from a Jew was born again and became a Christian, but that this Nicholas retained some of the old pagan ways, combined with some of his Jewish philosophies he'd picked up, and mixed it with Bible truth or, or Christian faith to make a strange admixture of paganism and Judaism and Christianity, one aspect of which the very word Nicolaitan refers to a belief in separating the so-called clergy from the laity. And what it means is to oppress the people. You have a ruling religious class oppressing the people. And it's, it, you think whatever group you want to consider, whatever cult you want to think of, it's set up on some kind of a hierarchy. Most notably, you have the Roman Catholic Church, starting from the Pope and the Cardinals and the Archbishops and the Bishops and uh, the Monsignors, and working its way down to the common priests, and the brothers, and then eventually down to the lowly peons in the pews who support the whole mess above them. And you see it in the cults. You know, the, we were just talking uh, with some folks earlier before the service. In our leadership time, we we're talking about Mormonism, and it has its present president and its quorum of 12, and then it has its local bishops, 
and uh, it works its way down to where the people who support all of that with their with their ties and with their their, their efforts and you know in the, in the watchtower society the jehovah's witnesses you've got a mysterious group in in brooklyn that runs the entire worldwide operation and everybody is working to support them and they keep themselves hidden from view and uh, they're, they're, they're the, 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 the secret puppet masters of the whole operation. And so it goes. So you have here in Nicolaitan doctrine a mixture of paganism and Christianity. And as you turn now, please, back to Jeremiah 23, verse number 9. You combine a ruling clergy and an oppressed laity with an insertion of paganism all combined with Christianity. And beloved, you put that all together, and I'll tell you what I see. I see Roman Catholicism. I see Orthodox Catholicism. Because Catholicism loves to say, unlike those Protestants and those Baptists, we're just one big happy family and always have been. No, the biggest church split in history was when Eastern Catholicism and Western Catholicism split in about the, the uh, 11th century, and never, well, I mean, in the last days, I'm sure they'll come together in the universal church. But, uh, but, but uh, they've ne but always have been at, at, at odds ever since. And so uh, I also see there, frankly, Protestantism. So many Protestant churches, which are the daughters of Rome, and are slowly but surely going back to mama, they too have a tendency to want to set themselves up on a hierarchical basis, and clergy is very distinct from laity, and a prime mark of that, stop and think now for a moment, how do you know instantly that's clergy and I ain't? Man, the robes, the vestments. You know the word vestments is biblical? Vestments are never attached to, 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 God, to, to the New Testament churches, but they are a mark of Paganisms, yeah, paganism, and I understand the priests of the Old Testament. They had their special special attire, but the the word vestments is particularly attached to pagan worship. This idea that I'm going to dr even dress in such a way that sets me apart and above you. You say, well, Pastor, you are above us literally, not just in height, but up there on that platform. Well, you know that too is a biblical thing, and when Ezra went to to, to speak to the people. He did it from a platform of wood, not because he's greater than anybody or higher than anybody, but just so everybody can see him and hear him. That's the only purpose. Just, just, just to make it a conveniency. But that's what we're seeing here. Now, similarly, Jeremiah had a discuss with the prophets and priests of his day that felt that they were somehow above everybody else they were somehow untouchable. They were beyond the, the, the ordinary, everyday problems of their people. They didn't want to dirty themselves by getting in, personally involved with their people. And it says in verse number 9, My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man and like a man whom wine hath overcome because of the Lord and because of the words of his holiness. Jeremiah says, I am staggered. When, when I receive the word of God and I hear what God has in mind for our country and I realize it goes back to these men who were given the job of preaching the truth and instead what do they do? They, they do things like, do you remember the time when Jeremiah, as an illustration to God's people, he was told by the Lord to make himself a yoke of wood and wear it around. So he's wearing this heavy yoke and to picture one day, man, the yoke of slavery is coming on you people if you don't repent. And so another prophet comes along and breaks the yoke of wood. And so, so will the Lord, you know, break, you know, the oppression of our enemies. And he's going to have the victory. And it was a well-received patriotic message of hope and deliverance. We're going to win. Thus saith the Lord. And the true God said to Jeremiah, okay, you now go make a yoke of iron and try to get, the, see if that guy can break that. And you go back in that crowd of preachers and say, 
you're not you are not going to change God's word my word is that this country's going down whether it's a popular or unpopular message means nothing it, it's it's what will happen and the result of this of these men and their their, their poor preaching is found in verse 10 for the land is full of what oh my doesn't that sound like today for because of swearing the land mourneth doesn't that sound today like today the pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up and their course is evil and their force is not right they do have an agenda they do have a course but it's a going a bad direction the wrong direction and these men do have a force about them beloved it ain't my books in the Christian bookstores of today it's their books it's not my face showing up on their broadcasting networks it's their faces their voices their philosophy their message that is taking the Christian world by storm this is the foremost thing that brother Brown has to face in Korea it won't be even though Christianity may not necessarily be a majority religion in South Korea his main contender for the hearts of the people is going to be Protestantism and perhaps a little bit of dead Baptist thrown in alongside because those people have a form of godliness denying the power thereof and they're gonna they're gonna use a lot of the same lingo but with a totally different meaning let me tell you where a lot of this goes back to in the 1950s a man by the name of Harold Okinga decided that we're just not winning the world like we need to but his solution was not more holiness more righteousness more evangelism no, his approach was completely the opposite. He said, we need to become much more open and inclusive. We need to be like the world to win the world. And his approach became known as neo or new evangelicalism. It was a new approach on the idea of evangelizing the world, doing so by becoming much more user-friendly, or the term now the last 20 years, seeker-sensitive. In other words, let's think about what the community wants Let's think about what the lost person is looking for, and let's, let's craft our whole presentation to that end. And you, you, you get a, a preacher coming in and saying, you know, it's time for us to quit talking about sin, and particularly specific sins. Because that is offensive, and it drives people away. And whatever you do, don't preach on hell. In fact, let me put one up on that let's quit preaching altogether it's time for us to praise and worship in a way that the lost person will find palatable and enjoyable attractive and then let's sit on our stool behind our little plexiglass lectern in our polo shirts and little microphone clipped on there and let's just schmooze with the crowd let's just now Back in my era, we would have called it wrapped together. That it now has taken on a different meaning. So, uh, but let's just let's just let's just talk. Low key, soft voice, big smile, soft lights, and everything is just so comfortable, so enjoyable. What a difference from "Thus saith the Lord." You need to be born again, or you're going to split hell wide open. You know that doesn't fly real well today. But can I tell you, it remains the truth. Even with the bad grammar, it's still the truth. Even with the bad attitude, it's still the truth. Now, if we could somehow give the truth without being needlessly offensive, that's probably a good way to go. And I'm working on it. Right? I'm working on it. But, but, uh, and, and you'd be amazed how many things I don't say. Because I'm thinking, oh, it's just not the time, the place, not the right mixture of crowd here and I'm not trying to say I'm trying to hide the truth or trying not to preach the truth I'm trying to say, I'm just trying to be cautious or trying to be aware of who I'm preaching to you know the Apostle Paul when he went into a community he preached differently to the rich than he did the common folk there's there was wisdom there he addressed his he he he, uh, he had a message where he would meet with those in authority he'd meet with the upper crust privately 
And he'd preach to them the gospel in a little different way than he did the common people. Now, that may not, I mean, initially you hear that, it's like, oh, you know, just preach the same way everybody. But I'm trying to say that I, apparently there's some wisdom in that. That's still a far cry from just a blanket statement that says, we don't, we don't talk about hell around here. In fact, we just don't preach around here. We just talk. Now, I, I, last I read in my Bible, we're to lift up our voice. And we're to give forth the message loud and clear. And I realize there's, there's a certain time and a certain place for certain things. And, and, and I'm like you. There are times, man, I love certain antics of preachers. And I love getting drawn into their message. And I love it, man, when they have, they, they powerfully make a point. And I love when they run up and down the aisles. And I love when they climb up on the furniture. And I love it when they, they shout and spit and sweat and stink. And, man, just, just raising a riot. And there are times when it just comes across like crass showmanship. And it's just like, uh, and, 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 you, and it's, it's, it's something that I as a pastor try to discern, this preacher, is this real or is this manufactured? Is this the Holy Spirit working in him? Or is this guy just trying to, you know, create his own notoriety and trying to generate and, and manufacture his own image? And trying to come across in such a way that he feels like we'll get people going. And it, and it is true, beloved, the most backslidden preacher in America can fire up a crowd just by talking about the King James Bible. A crowd like ours. He can get amens and glory to gods and hallelujahs just by hitting certain hot topics from our movement. And be totally, himself personally, totally separated from God. And having no walk with God at that time of his life whatsoever. So... I, I enjoy it when a guy can hit all the buttons, when he's funny, when he's serious, when he makes me laugh, when he makes me cry, when, when I'm just glued to him and like, what's he going to say next? What's he going to do next? But it had better well be led of the Holy Spirit and not just a, an act he's perfected. He knows what turns on the Baptists. But, but with Okinga, with that whole evangelical movement, it is a purposeful decision that we are going to be much less Christian and purposefully much more worldly so that we can attract the common person out in the world. And it has seemed at times to work. Many of today's mega churches are churches built on that kind of philosophy. Rick Warren has taken that to a whole new level of sophistication, organization, and he's made it, he's greatly popularized it to the point that many of our preachers are now going that direction. I just heard from one of our evangelists, called, let me know he'd be in the area, and he said, oh, and by the way, brother, I need you to know, just in case it, it, it's, it's important to you that I'm no longer with my original church. Like, wow. And uh, we talked a little bit. He did, I did not ask for specifics. We'll talk about specifics later when he comes. I said, uh, I asked him, is this, is this a result of the pastor in the church is becoming more contemporary, going more that direction? Yeah. It doesn't shock me because they've had a major building program. Buildings are expensive to build and maintain. You get your money from people. And if you have a message that's straight and hard today, sometimes people disappear. And with it goes their pocketbook, their checking account. And so you, you start saying, okay, what, what can we do here to make this more palatable to the community, make it more popular, make where people come in? Because we're desperate to pay this pastoral salary and all this staff and all these buildings and all of our programs have got to be financed. And suddenly, it's, it's, there's a desperate need. It can happen to a Bible college. It can happen to a church. I, I'll tell you what's interesting, though. This guy told me, yeah, we're losing a lot of our best families right now. See, sometimes, not all that glitters is gold. Some kind, sometimes these guys make huge changes. And they, I, I was... <laughs> I was discussing this on, sun, on uh, Friday night with the men who came for men's late night prayer meeting. And I, I was saying to these guys that, uh, you know, 
if I were to pull that stunt here, I'd say, you know, bless God, we're, we, we got all this debt for our rent we got to take care of, and we want, there's so much more we want to do. We want to move. We'd like to have our own building, our own property someday, and it's just not happening with this old gospel message, this old Bible. I think it's time now. I think we need an easier, understood version. I think we need to have music beyond just the piano. I, I said to David Scott, I said, let's get rid of your acoustic guitar and get you a bass guitar. You know, and, and uh, let's, man, we'll, we'll, we'll get some of our guys on a, on a drum set, you know, and we'll, and we'll start learning how to change our lighting. So we'll get some colored lights up here. We'll learn how to, we'll, we'll get light, you know, dimmer switches so we can dim it down, make it feel really cool in here, you know, and we'll start just really getting into praising and worshiping Jesus. And we're just going to, and you know what? I would be slitting my throat because I can tell you we've got about a dozen of our best families that would tolerate it to a degree because they love me and they love our church and they're heavily invested here. But there would come a point at which they'd say, as for me and my house, we, we must serve the Lord. And it ain't happening here anymore. And, and we're, we're gone. And in the long run, I think we'd send this church down. We would kill this church. Well, I am barely started in this message, and already time is again me, as usual. Say, Pastor, where are we? Well, it's six pages of notes, and we're not even halfway through page three. It's a, it's a hopeless battle. But I think you got the gist of it. We're, we're, this is what we're looking at today. And I, I, I guess I should at least find the verse that is the, uh, the title of the message. Um, um, where is that anyway? Um, I guess I'll just have to quote it to you. I got a bunch of stuff underlined, but it's not popping out at me. But there came a point at which... Jeremiah said, oh, I know, I got a couple of good guys right now with their little, their little computer Bibles. They're going to find this in about three seconds. <laughs> Keywords, horrible thing. Thank you, Jacob. Keyword, Keywords, horrible thing. Book of Jeremiah, chapter 23. I have seen a horrible thing. Which verse am I looking for? See, see if you can, okay, the adult, the, 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 the man against machine. Let's see who can find it first, me or, or you. Uh, I have seen a horrible thing. Ah, the woman got it! And, uh, who did that, Marilyn? You even beat Jacob Balser? Larry Frank? This is great. Way to go, Marilyn. Verse 21. Verse 14. Oh, 14, I'm sorry. Um, let's take a look then at verse 14. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers, and none doth return from his wickedness. So they are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah, O oh my soul. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> That's like the ultimate insult from God to us, to a, a group of people that are so-called religious or spiritual. You're like, you're like a bunch of Sodomites and Gomorrah, Gomorans, Gomorans. The prophets... It's a horrible thing. They're, they themselves are committing adultery. They walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers. They don't return, and, and, and none of the people under their ministry return from his wickedness. Man, it's come as you are, leave as you are. No change. And in the eyes of God, and in Jeremiah's eyes, that is a horrible thing. And it's what we're seeing today, all around us, a horrible thing. People who are in churches where there's no challenge to change. I mean other than, let's be more green. The more I hear from you, the greener my face is becoming. I'm about to throw up, all right? Uh, let's all be nice to each other. Let's stop that bullying. Well, if my bullying will help you do right, then I, once in a while I'm gonna be a little abusive just not because I'm mean-spirited, because I love you. And I remember how many times for me, some preacher would come along, and I love the way Doug Fisher describes it so graphically, I need to rip your face off. And you know what? He did, man. And he, he could rip me up and expose me for who I am, and that was good for me. And, once, and, and I know you, you, 
you can get too much of anything and too much of just uh, can, be a, can be overwhelmed. But I learned from him how he could give you the sweetest message and then rip your face off the next time, you know. And, and, I, and I try to learn from that and try to moderate, you know, try to change things up when it's well. It's not always standard, standard, standards. It's not always soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. It's not always, you know, you're, you're rotten. You're <laughs> the first time I heard the, the name Fred Phelps, now Fred Phelps has got to be the biggest jerk who's ever called himself a Baptist. You'd know better the name Westboro Baptist Church. God hates fags, you know, and disrupting military funerals and so forth. Uh, that, that's, that's his group. He recently passed away, and I was hoping that whole nonsense would disappear, but I don't know. I mean, how is it? We have, we have, we have a challenge just getting people to do the right thing, and, and they have people from their church who go all over the country to hold up and, and have people hate their guts, and they'll hold up their, their terrible signs and disrupt military funerals, and I don't understand. I don't understand how... <laughs> How do you get, I'm just trying to get people to do right. And you got people going over the country to do wrong. I don't understand how, it, how that works. But the first time I ever heard the name Fred Phelps, he, he was a message that went around our church as a cassette tape at one time. And the title of the message was, You Stink. You, that was Fred Phelps' style. You stink. And he stood up there and he preached. He railed on his church. You stink. And then he got on individuals. You, Hamilton Rodriguez, we've seen you coming out of the liquor store. Brother, you stink. You stink in the nostrils of God. And you, Bolser, we saw what you had in your, your, your DVD kennel back in those days. Your, your, what would they have? <laughs> whatever, whatever it was. Little eight millimeter cameras. Bolser, you stink. And you, Alan Hambly, looking back there so sharp, you missed church Wednesday night. You stink. And you, Hanson, we've been looking at your giving records. You stink. You're an offense to the muscles of God. Well, of course, to us, it was hilarious. Young preachers that made us round. We thought this guy was a crack up. But unfortunately, that wasn't a joke. He was for real. You stink. So, I try, at times, yeah, blunt, at times, pretty direct. But I also want you to know, God loves you. And I love you. And we need to love each other. We need to love the Lord and serve him with gladness. And not just because, oh, man, if I don't do something pastor wants, he'll get up in front of me and say, I stink. <laughs> And a horrible thing is now happening all around us. And I, all I can tell you is, I ain't going that way. And I hope you won't either. As we bow our heads, please, and close our eyes. My goodness, how that book speaks to us. Even an Old Testament prophet has much to teach us today. Goodness, he's speaking about pastors. And what do we have today? We have pastors. He's talking about men of God who are involved in adultery. And sadly, that's in fact, especially in this age of easy access to the worst filth imaginable, it's rife even among some of our preachers. And it's sad to say. That's why we have to preach against it, stand against it. Once in a while, a, man's, a man of God's going to go down. It's going to be shocking, but we shake our heads. Sorry that happened, but we just move on. You know, we're not, we're not going to let his downfall become our downfall. Well, I just don't know if I trust fundamentalism anymore. Can I say to you that when one of our own goes down, they go down despite everything that they stood for, everything they preached, everything that they said they believed. It was not because of who or what they were. It was despite what they were supposed to be. And that's what I love about our movement. If, if someday I mess up and I go down in flames, 
you mark it down. It's not because I was a fundamentalist, not because I was a Baptist, not because I went to New Hope Baptist Church. It was despite my fundamental position, because it goes directly contrary to everything I believe as a fundamentalist. It goes despite my being a Baptist, because Baptists have always preached righteousness and holiness. It's despite my being a member of New Hope Baptist Church, because this church resists and stands against that stuff. We don't, we don't encourage it. We don't condone it. We, we hate it, and we fight against it. And we, we try to be loving and kind to the person who gets their, their hand caught in the cookie jar, and, and we'll try to help them get restored. But we're not just going to let it go with a pass. And I think you'd be surprised if you knew how much we're dealing with some things behind the scenes. I don't think it requires us publicly humiliating the wrongdoer. Only insofar as their deed is public will the correction be public. If everybody knows about it, then I may have to bring it before everybody. But if only a handful are affected, I'm going to try to keep it that limited. Not because we're trying to hide something. Not because we're afraid to deal with it. Because I want to minimize the damage and, if possible, preserve a family or some families. If they feel utterly shamed and humiliated, they're gone and they ain't never coming back. And I can't really say I blame them. Now, if it becomes habitual, yeah, we want them gone. But if it's a matter of a downfall and, and there's, there's hope for recovery, we'll work with that. I guess, I don't know why I'm led to say all these extra things, but just to reassure you that as we have had our hearts broken by men that we looked up to and we admired and they went down in flames, it was not because they were an independent fundamental Baptist, but despite it, they were acting against what they claimed to believe. If they had stayed doing what they should have been doing, they never would have had that sin destroy their lives. It's because they, they, in their private life they went away from what they claimed to believe in their public ministry. That's what destroyed them. That double life. Hey, if there's anybody in here who's living a double life, I would encourage you, get it right, right now. If you're involved in an affair or you're dabbling in that, if you even have a secret infatuation with another person, especially if they're within this congregation, you need to get rid of that real fast. If you're dabbling in pornography, if you're, if you're dealing with other things that are wrong, if you're, if we, have, we could have someone in this room right now who could be a secret shoplifter because it's, it's an addictive behavior. People get high on the adrenaline of successfully stealing something. You need to take care of that before you end up having it bring down your whole life, crashing around your ears. Whatever it is in your life, let's, let's get it taken care of. And let's keep on being the church that's pleasing to God while so many around us are going a different direction, displeasing to Him. Lord, please help us tonight. Speak to our hearts. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Let's stand together, stand together please, beloved. The altar is open. I'm available here if you need salvation or baptism or have another need you want to discuss. I'm here available to you. The altar is open for a few moments. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your church. Pray for your country. If you have a need yourself personally, pray for that. Also, as we come around to the next verse, feel free to lead us into it. What number, brother? 303 on Jordan Stormy Banks I think is this tune I'm hearing you come as you feel led as we sing this song verse number one on Jordan Stormy
and sorrow, pain and death are felt and feared no more. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. When shall And in